Static linking. Um, wow, that was powerful. Uh, uh, static linking, you'll be including the code directly. So it's being copied directly into whatever you're building at that time. And then dynamic, um, the code is going to be somewhere else. You're just leaving a, a reference saying that at runtime, something needs to find that other code and uh, establish that link later. And then later at runtime, you'll have something uh, go through and actually locate the code, hopefully, or crash. It might do that too. So how did we get here? Um, it's been kind of a long journey to even having some of these options on iOS. Um, in fact, it was pretty simple when things got started. 
uh, we had dynamic linking, but it was only for system libraries, UIKit, Foundation, um, only for stuff that was already on the device. And you had a single binary in your app package, and that's your entry point, the executable, uh, and nothing else. Apps were pretty simple. And you know, we had static libraries as a way of potentially um, saving your own code or distributing stuff. But again, that's really just a collection of pre-compiled objects that are waiting to get dumped into some final um, binary. And these are basically runtime restrictions. That there was going to be delivery and runtime restrictions. You weren't allowed to deliver multiple executables, multiple uh, runnable files, and at runtime, there would be nothing there to establish those links. Um, starting in the Xcode 4 series, things start to change a little bit. Uh, traditionally, there was this kind of hybrid setup of the GCC front end compiler and LLVM for the back end code generation, actually, progressively more and more of our tools are based on it. And by Xcode 5 in 2013, uh, LLVM is now the only supported compiler setup for the iPhone development um, and all the tools. And you'll see that the tools are increasingly built on this infrastructure. It's very modular, and it has allowed them to uh, iterate pretty quickly on all the various parts of the tooling. Uh, it would definitely do you well to drink a little bit of the LLVM Kool-Aid, <laughs> since so much of the tooling is based on it. And now at Xcode 6 in 2014, stuff starts to get really interesting. Uh, Swift is released, of course, very heavily based on the LLVM compiler infrastructure. And also, extensions are now available. So both of these things um, lead to a fundamental change in our app structure. And that is multiple runnable binary files in the same app bundle. Uh, you could have extensions as different actual entry points into your app and dynamic frameworks um, wrapping some Swift functionality or really any functionality you want. But they were added basically in support of these new features. And in Xcode 9, all the way to 2017, you finally have the option basically to link and assemble this stuff any way you want. Uh, you're pretty restricted to using uh, dynamic libraries for your dependencies if you wanted to use Swift files, or um, the Swift language, rather up to that point. So with Xcode 9, it becomes less of necessity and restriction, and suddenly you can think about what's actually best for how to deliver your code. And more recently, Xcode 10.2, Swift has reached ABI stability. Now that's important for our purposes, uh, because that will take advantage um, of the, the dynamic linking that Swift was doing for its standard libraries. Those standard libraries are now available on device for anything running, um, is it X or uh, iOS 12.2 and later. So without changing your compiled code, without compiling multiple times, uh, the App Store can just strip out those extra frameworks and binaries when delivering to a device that is Xcode or that is iOS 12.2 or later. Then with our upcoming beta, uh, Swift has reached module stability, or at least it's planning to. Uh, that is less important for what we're talking about here, but it does touch on that um, that code delivery idea, 
that when you compile something with the Swift 5.1 compiler, and you want to deliver that to clients, other people on your team, uh, you won't need to recompile as soon as the Swift 5.1 compiler comes out, as soon as Swift 6 comes out. So the days of that error message of uh, module compiled with the Swift 4.2 compiler cannot be imported by the Swift 5 compiler are behind us, hopefully. Uh, and also, we are finally getting uh, this improvement to the runtime linking process uh, that has been available on Mac and the system libraries for some time. Uh, this allows some caching of the upfront cost of finding and establishing the linking between uh, your app and those dynamic libraries that you may be delivering. So what we can tell from this history here is that we started out pretty basic, and these capabilities were added very incrementally. Didn't really get it all at once. Uh, so if you see some questionable choices made in an old project, I mean, think about it. You may not have actually been able to, uh, you may not have had much choice for how you structure your dependencies. And these were all added in support of higher level features. So, you know, as soon as Apple needed something, suddenly it was possible. It's certainly the way it feels. And what we have now is flexible sharing of code within the app container. You might have multiple entry points, extensions, your main app that you get every time you just tap the icon. Uh, and you can arrange your dynamic dependencies however you like. But there's still really no way to link across apps. You can't deliver a shared library and save on space and memory when your company delivers a few different apps, for example. All right, so again, let's drink some of that Kool-Aid. Uh, LLVM is modular and all built to work together and mix and match these frameworks to build tools that allow you to do interesting things. For example, in the classic method of compilation, again, you've got all of these source files generally making one-to-one -one object code files full of machine code. And then eventually at the linking step, those are pretty much put together um, in a final binary without too much modification. So enter link time optimization that we have available. Instead of generating straight up machine code from those original source files, uh, it generates this bit code, which much of the LLVM pipeline is based on. These files are much bigger. There's a lot more information there. It puts off the optimization. It puts off dead code stripping. It puts off inlining, all that stuff until much later in the process. There we go. So instead, you have this very verbose, very, very early unoptimized bit code, uh, which will then later be combined and optimized all at the same time. And this gives you actually a bunch of different things you can do with it. Uh, it works across libraries. So when you're combining dependencies, when you're combining uh, functions from different places, you can wait until they're actually together for the optimizer to decide what to do. It even works across languages. So if you have some Swift, a little bit of C, uh, C++, the optimizer can make optimizations across those language boundaries, inline a C function into the middle of a Swift function, for example. Make those optimizations, again, late in the process when it has a really good idea of what it looks like. 
though it's not free. It's pretty slow, as anyone who's tried it in the last couple of years, and it uses a ton of memory. I mean, it may not even work. I mean, it, it's a lot of memory. For a big project, it's pretty painful. But we do have this incremental mode for fast debug builds, um, and that allows kind of an in-between hybrid approach. It's mostly still all done in parallel. You still get some of the benefits of uh, late optimization, but at the same time, changing one file doesn't force an entire recompile. And the memory and time requirements are pretty close to just a regular compilation. And this is pretty close to what you see in the Swift compilation mode, that whole module versus single file. And uh, the recommendation is to use it. I mean, Apple's using it very extensively. Um, I actually got this from an, a talk in 2016. So by 2016, they were all, already using it extensively inside Apple and on the device, getting 10% performance speed up just for free, just by enabling this option, and significantly more if using profile-guided optimization. So recommendation, enable it. Enable it in release mode and in debug mode, keep it on but use the lightweight incremental version in both cases. Um, single file, incremental for debug mode and in release mode, go ahead and let it work its magic on the entire module. That's actually the talk I mentioned there. They go into um, kind of a deep dive of what link time optimization is and uh, the results that they've had working with it internally, as well as how it differs from that hybrid incremental approach. In fact, there's a what's new in LLVM pretty much every year, if you're interested. So that's another good one to watch. Okay, so we have a couple of different library types uh, in the meantime. Static library, as I mentioned, is just archived, compiled, not linked, not really assembled code. Um, it's, it's waiting for a purpose. Good to think of as a save point that you can uh, either turn it directly into a dynamic library later or make it part of an executable or just part of some other dynamic library that you're building. And again, when you're doing that uh, link time optimization, uh, the compiler will actually create an archive of that bit code. Again, it'll be huge, but it allows you to still defer that optimization pass until later in the process when it has a better chance of actually catching things that can be optimized. So yeah, you get basically a zip file full of that pre-optimized stuff ready to um, be added to the rest of your compilation process. Now, a dynamic library, on the other hand, it happens on the other side of that uh, linking, sorry, of the delivery. It's ready for distribution. This is code that's ready to run. Uh, it's fully compiled and it's not going to be taken apart or rearranged in any way. It's ready to drop into your application's framework folder to be linked when you run or later. So it's loadable and it's unloadable. Uh, so if you want to be clever about things, you can take it out of memory when it's not needed. However, all of this stuff does come at a cost. Um, it takes extra work to find these libraries and load them, as well as when you make a call into them, there's some extra indirection for each one of those calls. So what about a framework? 
haven't really mentioned frameworks yet. Um, and that's because they're basically just a bundle directory structure, just like an app. It's a, it's a well-known directory structure with uh, an info plist, a dynamic library where the actual code lives. And unless it's been stripped out for distribution, you'll have headers and documentation, maybe. And of course, you can deliver resources along with it, too. So that makes these really a good way to, um, to deliver a dependency to someone just ready to go. Yeah, so they're more related to packaging and delivery, kind of that step, that part of things. Uh, it's really something you do after you've already linked your code together, decided how you want to package and deliver stuff. Right. Uh, should you use frameworks? Uh, this is the CocoaPods way of saying how to deal with your dependencies. Um, but usually, it's more like this. Maybe even more than that. In fact, probably at some point, dependencies can get a little out of control. Um, and that's when dynamic linking really takes its toll. So use frameworks in CocoaPods land. Uh, it means embed each one of your dependencies as a separate dynamic library, again, in that folder structure that we call a framework. So maybe a better, more general way of posting this would be, given the option, should dependencies be static or dynamic? Well, what does a static library dependency mean from the perspective of third-party code? Uh, it can be easily optimized. We know that. Um, it is always loaded. Wherever you're linking it to, all that code is always going to be loaded into memory immediately when that executable or that resulting library is loaded. Um, and most, most of the code in it that's not used can be ignored or stripped away. Most of it. And this is where Objective-C is showing its age. Um, the best thing about Objective-C is probably also the worst thing about Objective-C. It's very dynamic. It's so dynamic that the compiler has a tough job of trying to figure out what's actually used and what's not. And also, Objective-C has uh, some runtime loading costs, uh, most obvious being uh, the static or the class method load. Uh, that, can, that runs immediately when that binary is loaded into memory. So it does become difficult to optimize away. I mean, you may think, well, I know I don't use this class at all. But Remember, you've got the Objective-C runtime behind the scenes. And the Objective-C runtime can create any class from just from a string. So even if the, the text of that class name doesn't exist anywhere in your project, it is still has the capability to load it. So the optimizer can't just say, get rid of that class. And it's the same for unused methods, uh, because selectors basically work the same way. So I'm sure not many people would argue with this, but continue to move to more Swift. And if you do have something in Objective-C, uh, consider just converting it to C. If it's a, a tight loop or uh, needs optimization, and you don't feel like making the migration to Swift. So what about a dynamic library dependency? taking a third-party library and just immediately packaging it up as a framework and including it as is. Well, here you don't even have the option. You must include all that unused code. So that's, uh, that's a con there. And every dynamic library at runtime has that loading cost where it needs to be found and linked. Now, I mentioned that in... Um, iOS 13, we get some improvements there, but uh, it's not 
better. It's not, uh, it's not completely gone, that loading co cost. However, you can share these between executables. So if you have an extension and an app at the same time that are both using it, you just saved um, a lot of download, potentially. If you can only include that once and have both the extension and the app both refer to it. And this one doesn't come up too much, but I really want to spend some time on this. A framework, a dynamic library, can be loaded on demand. So you can skip that app launch time penalty. Uh, you can skip all of that and just load it later when it's ready. It is a thing. It's not only a thing, it is officially supported. It's not a hack. Um, it was, in fact, when dynamic libraries were first added, iOS 8, to support both iOS 8 and 7, this was the way you had to do it. You had to check to make sure you were in a device that could support this and then load your framework or your, load your dynamic library on demand. So the way you do this is you build the dynamic framework. It's as simple as going into Xcode and creating a new dynamic framework target. Uh, but do not link it to the resulting application. Embed it, don't link it. Again, that avoids that app, app launch time penalty. It also avoids memory usage when not in use. So all that code needs to be loaded into memory, and you can wait until you need it. And this still allows you to static link related code into that library. So in other words, take if you have a, a part of your app that does something that absolutely needs to be in the app, but rarely happens any time near launch time, you can segment that off, statically link the related dependencies together, and then deliver that framework unlinked in your bundle. But it definitely adds complexity. So you really want to weigh that against, is it worth saving a couple of megs of memory or more, depending? So this is how you would do that. Got your application, maybe establish some shared APIs that uh, will tell you what is actually going to be exposed by that framework. Because again, you can't load the framework uh, to get, for example, Swift, you can't load the framework to use the protocols until the framework's loaded. So it makes sense to establish your APIs externally and then uh, put your implementation in the, uh, the lazy loaded, the late loaded framework. In this one, we called it literally just rarely used. So we might define an API like rarely used, and we put it in that shared APIs. And then in that rarely used framework, we would make uh, an implementation. Uh, pretty basic here, except for at least some entry point should have uh, an Objective-C class. Uh, that's how we're going to be referring to it later, so we need to have that Objective C annotation there and inherit from NS object. So here's what I mentioned about embed everything, but only link what you want to be linked immediately at runtime, at uh, launch time rather. And then on demand, this is here's the actual magic is this finding the framework as a bundle, and finding that class named, the Objective-C class name that we used before. So it'll find it, dynamically load the bundle and everything in it, and then return you the class. And then from, say, your application, you can use it as basically you would anything else. And here, that. Uh, KJC create rarely used instance, 
the first time that's called, that's going to load the, the other bundle. And after that, it will already be in memory, and it'll be very quick. Uh, there are also APIs on NS bundle to unload code. We have to be a lot more careful with that because it, you know, it may not even work. You need to be very sure you're not actually still using any code from the bundle. All right, right. Uh, I was answering this question at one point. Uh, so given the option, should those dependencies be static or dynamic? Well, I would say the dependencies themselves should be built as static libraries wherever possible. Uh, it's not always possible. Sometimes you'll run into problems. And in fact, a dynamic library is just a lot easier, kind of self-contained. But at the same time, build a framework wrapper of related code. Statically link those dependencies and related business logic. If you've got a part of your app that does media playback and has a couple dependencies related to that, maybe another that does some, uh, some parsing social media stuff related to that, keep those in separate framework targets. You know, don't be afraid of that framework target in Xcode just as a one-off to help organize your app. And expose the public API via that framework target. Because then the compiler will be able to see exactly what needs to be, what entry points that framework will have and can make intelligent decisions about stripping out the unneeded code. This is also, again, really great for sharing a large dependency between the application and its extensions. And yeah, potentially load it and unload it on demand. Again, that's it's a lot of extra work, but if you have a large application that has a lot of different things and you can segment it to load as little as possible on app launch, this could be a huge win for launch time. Just very quickly, like, when do you need these different techniques? If it's something you need at app launch, try your best to get it statically linked into that executable. Same with an extension launch. For that very first frame, the very first thing that you are showing, try to get it statically linked in the executable. If you need something from both your app and your extension, uh, build a framework target and dynamically link to both. Unless, you know, if it's small enough, I mean, give it a try. See, just go ahead and try statically linking and uh, give it a shot to see if it expands your app size too much or if it really even has that much of an impact on launch time. And if it's deep in a deep flow, it's a rarely used part of the application, uh, really consider that on-demand loading style. Because uh, there's no reason to keep all of that stuff in memory all the time and slow down your app launches for rarely used functionality. Or even just for something that is already happening behind a, a spinner or some kind of um, delay anyway. So going back through the recommendations we've, we've seen at this point, uh, migrate your Objective-C to Swift and C wherever you can. Um, and again, this, this actually includes uh, Swift that is annotated with Objective-C, Objective-C members, uh, all that kind of stuff. That still ends up as uh, difficult to optimize, optimize out. And then enable that link time optimization and whole module optimization with their incremental counterparts for debug builds so that you don't want to kill yourself every time you uh, have to compile your app. Now, the um, dependencies, consume them as static libraries wherever possible, but then use the dynamic linking, use a framework wrapper to be very certain about exactly when and where you're loading these things. Organize them into custom dynamic wrappers. And consider that loading and unloading on demand. 
Um, it is, again, it's extra work, but it can be a big win for certain applications. And finally, probably most important, is profile these things. Luckily, we got a great new tool in Xcode 11 in the developer tools, and that is the app launch instrument template. Uh, this is really great. Uh, they show you how to use it in this, uh, this year's optimizing app launch. And it's really easy to drill right down in there and see where the time is being spent on your app launch. Like this amount of time, this is happening uh, because you're loading dynamic libraries. Here is because you've got an objective C load method that does something silly. Um, this is, you know, this is the way that you go in and check what's actually taking time in your app launch. All right, and that's it. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you can use, you can still use CocoaPods. Uh, the, the answer was, uh, the question was, let me make sure I get this right. Um, you've, you've used CocoaPods but never created a framework for yourself, right? Oh, yeah. So um, generally, like, what's the difference between uh, these libraries, pods, um, what's the connection there? Generally, CocoaPods kind of does a lot of this for you. The default setup, it creates a bunch of uh, frameworks for each one of your pods. Each one of your pods becomes a different framework, and uh, they're all delivered into your app there. Um, so, so they each, right, so they each become a, a dynamic framework, yeah. That's usually how uh, it's set up by default. So what I'm saying is you can, um, instead, you can create a framework target in your Xcode project and tell CocoaPods to put your uh, dependencies under that, uh, that target. So if you're, uh, in my example there, it was uh, rarely used. So instead of just listing my pods, um, I would list them under the rarely used target. And uh, there's, a, there's another option, I think, uh, use modular headers. But in general, if you don't use that uh, use frameworks, you'll get static linking anyway. Oh, yeah. I, is, uh, the question was, is on-demand linking that common? And I would say probably not. <laughs> it seems like a lot of people were using it right around when, um, when iOS 7 and 8 were in the wild and you couldn't do some things because iOS 7 didn't support dynamic loading. Uh, but after that, it seems like it hasn't gotten much <laughs> activity. Yeah, it, it could help. He said it would help the startup time for a lot of apps, and I definitely agree. Anybody else? Oh, hey. Yes. Yeah, so I, I do need to check. I don't want to say, the, the, the question was, uh, I said bitcode was an intermediate format that can then be used to optimize later. Um, but also, we deliver this bitcode to the App Store. And what's the relationship between those two? Uh, and I'm not sure if, uh, if it's exactly the same format. Um, I know they're both related to the intermediate format that LLVM uses in all of its uh, code generation, optimization, debugging, and all that. 
I'm not sure if it's that same level of detail that Apple actually delivers to the App Store as well. Yeah, so from what I've seen, uh, uh, you mentioned that it's hardware independent, uh, that it's not directly targeted to, for example, like ARM v7 or ARM64. And from what I've seen, it's not, it's not completely independent. Like it already has, uh, it's at least what's delivered to the App Store is already not necessarily generic enough to become ARM64 versus like ARM v7, but it may be able to be recompiled if, uh, if, for example, a new vector extension comes out. They may be able to turn one of your loops into a vector load or something like that. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much.